All right, welcome back to another episode of Secrets of a Bridal Seamstress. And today I am with the fabulous Stephanie Booth. And Stephanie and I met, I don't even... I don't even remember what year. Was that like 2017? It was when you were still doing the wedding photography thing with your husband and Stephanie's husband and I went to college together. So that's kind of where the connection was first initiated. And then I noticed, oh, this Stephanie is starting some business coaching that also has morphed to, to mindset coaching. But, um, I'm not exaggerating when I said it, Stephanie, like working with you has literally changed my life and like changed the trajectory of my business. And so I'm so thrilled to host you today and introduce our listeners to the concept of mindset work and how it can be really impactful when working in, you know, pretty high stress industry with brides. So thank you so much for being here. I'm so pumped. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, and it looks beautiful. I love your like office colors behind you. I love the sun pouring in on what kind of tree is that? Um, it is uh, like a rubber tree. Oh, I'm very impressed that it's like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I have like one very sad looking fern back here that is not in the view of the camera because <laughs> not looking too lush. <laughs> Okay, so let's kind of start from the beginning of when you were in the middle of your wedding business. I'll kind of save that for you to share what type of business it was and then how you even made this huge transformation to become a mindset coach. So, mm-hmm. Stephanie, take it away. Yeah. So, about 10 years ago, I was teaching 5th grade. <laughs> so, <laughs> it all goes back to teaching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and I met a really cute boy and he was building a photography business. And so there were a few times that he asked me to join him to like, come to a wedding with him. And I dressed up as a guest, not (laughs) understanding that he was taking photos like at all. Um, and suddenly he was doing these large group family photos. And I was like, oh, family photos. This is so much like wrangling kids in from recess. Like I'm super good at this. And so I just jumped in and started helping him and things naturally evolved from there. Like I jumped in, I started doing a little more at a time as he needed help. And suddenly we were running a full, full full-time wedding photography business, full-time for me. Wow he kept his job, his main job, because he likes to have a lot of different things going on. (laughs) It's not for me. Um, During this wedding photography season of our lives, which was nine years, building our wedding photography business, I started realizing how stressful it was. (laughs) And I started realizing I didn't really have the skills to um, meet the stressors. I did not know what to do about them. So what I was left with was taking them home every night Mm -hmm. and ranting in bed at 11 PM about all the things that I didn't know how to figure out and thinking the whole world was mad at me and feeling like I was doomed to disappoint everyone. And that was a really hard, hard way to work. And I just thought that's the way life was. I didn't know that there was another point of view that I could have. So Mm -hmm. I felt like the perspective I brought to wedding photography was, this is the way it is. Everyone is mad at me, fact. I have to then overdo it to prove to them that I'm worthy of their time, their money, their attention. And that's not... um, it's not healthy. It's not sustainable. And I didn't, once I started learning that I could change my perspective, the lens through which I, which I was viewing everything, then things started changing in my business. And that was pretty groundbreaking for me. Um, that changed learning that I could change my perspective, my mindset, around how people perceived me in my business, what I was capable of, um, how much I could achieve. Mm -hmm. Then I started learning. I was, I was just so into this topic of mindset and I started learning 
more and more over time, I started taking some certifications and ultimately I went into this um, world of mindset coaching as a profession because it was just, it was something I couldn't get enough of. I wow. was so thrilled to be in this world, learning about how the brain works and how we could mm -hmm. change our realities. Yeah. And probably your personal experience, like knowing how you just had a more relaxing evening, like something that simple, exactly. how it changed your life. You're like, okay, now how can I tell other people to live like this? You know? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. And even just hearing, oh my goodness, you saying how you would feel after a photo shoot. I mean, I know I've heard so many stories and I've been part of that too, where it's like, okay, I get done with a fitting or like a bride finally leaves with her dress. And I'm like, oh my word, I, I couldn't wait for her to get out of my life. And I know there are so many listeners in the same boat of feeling mm -hmm. like thinking it's all on them or expecting people to come into their studio already having like something against them or that they have to prove something to these clients, you know? So when mm -hmm. you're doing photography, like what, um, was it actual work with the equipment or was it like the relations with your clients, like what were your biggest stress points hmm. or things that made you feel like a weenie, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there were a lot of them and I would say I, I felt stress points. Uh, uh, I felt stress points in every area of business because the mentality I brought to the business was I'm not good enough. Mm. So therefore, and I can't figure it out to be good enough. So mm -hmm. that was just a belief I brought to everything. So like, if I find out I'm not good enough, I can't adapt in order to change that. Mm -hmm. So I just, I felt like a failure. I had, I would have like, um, like a collapse response before I even tried anything. I couldn't adapt in any situation. Um, and especially with clients. And that was really hard um, mm -hmm. because I cared about them and I genuinely wanted them to be happy. I loved seeing their relationships and their love and seeing how much their families loved them. Being a part of that was really special. And I felt like, why am I making everything weird? Mm -hmm. like, why does it have to be weird? Yeah. And I didn't understand how to put nuance and words to that experience. Um, I definitely had issues with boundaries and I struggled with, I would swing from being overly like porous boundaries. I think, um, Nedra Tawab has a book about boundaries. Um, if you haven't read it or listened to it, I would highly recommend um, she talks about porous boundaries and rigid boundaries, I think. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have healthy boundaries, you can swing from one end of the spectrum to the other. Yeah. And that was absolutely me. When I was really high stress, I would get really rigid in my boundaries. And um, just, I would make the issue about the boundary instead of what the client actually needed and how I could meet that within what I was willing to do. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't really yes. see around that at that point. Which is just so mind boggling because Stephanie recently led our membership in a training specifically on boundaries. And it was so clarifying for me and encouraging for me because I, I learned, oh, I have freedom with my boundaries. Cause I, we were just talking about this before we hit record that in the past, there had been times where I would stick to my boundaries and I'd be like, yeah, I'm the boss, babe, you know, don't cross me. But then I'm like, actually, I feel like a schmuck now. And I want to call that bride back and be like, let's talk about it again. You want to come back in and, or, you know, whatever the situation was or whatever, whoever the client was. And just knowing that there's freedom in that and, um, boundaries doesn't need to be this like all or nothing experience. Mm -hmm. So there's more on that subject within the training, but so like thinking of how you, your own boundaries morphed or that you at one point worked from that, you know, mindset is kind of like mind boggling. <laughs> it's like, wow, you've come a long really way. <laughs> Seriously. So having worked in the wedding industry and working with, oh, I think I interrupted you because, so how did you, um, are you still doing wedding photography at all? Or is that completely a thing in the past? It is a, we just closed our joint wedding photography business last year. 
Mm -hmm. Um, We stopped taking weddings 2020. So then we had um, some fulfillment to do throughout 2020. And then last year we moved to, from the Midwest to the West coast. And um, we knew that we wanted to have everything wrapped up by then. So um, that was the, that was the plan. We concluded that my husband just decided to launch his own wedding photography brand um, just like a few months ago. So he's been, he's been photographing on weekends and getting back into that. And I'm here to consult whenever he needs help. <laughs> <laughs> about I did about all the admin work. work yes. So, <laughs> But since you had worked in the wedding industry and you understand on a personal level, like the pressures mm-hmm. that can be, we can put on ourselves in a service-based industry, in the wedding industry, working with brides, you know, for our listeners as bridal seamstresses. So how could a mindset shift, like you just described, how would that affect our listeners? Kind of like starting from literally the foundation. Mm, Yeah. So to answer this, I'd love to share a piece of my story because it's what I can speak to and give people a a sense of what I was experiencing, Mm -hmm. if they can relate to that. So what I found was that the more stress I was under, the the worse my experience with anxiety and depression got. So Mm -hmm. I had some other things that were going on that I want to acknowledge and factor in, um, mental health issues, some trauma in my background that this was really triggering for. And what I started to find was I couldn't really get away from those things. And I started feeling within, I think it was like year four, I started feeling really boxed in. So I started feeling like, oh my word, I can't breathe. And I didn't know what, I didn't know anything about mental health that was really stigmatized in my growing up. So there was really nothing I knew about anxiety, um, about depression, about any of that. And it came to the point where I was sitting on the couch each morning, um, just trying to breathe and trying not to um, pass out with the panic attacks. And one morning it got so bad that I, I knew I was something was wrong physically and I didn't know what to do about it. So I, I, I had left my phone upstairs. I ran upstairs to call Steven and my husband and say, something's wrong. I think I need to go to the hospital. And I passed out on the stairs and just like woke up on the stairs. Um, word. And it was all panic attacks um, anxiety attacks, the one, yeah, it was just, it was a really intense time. And it was shortly thereafter that I started the pain of this season of my life got so great that something had to change. And it doesn't have to be like that for everybody, which is why like, I happily share my story and what I did learn, because like you could take the parts that I learned and skip the story, <laughs> skip the yeah. skip the difficulty. It just right. the trials and the tough stuff is absolutely not necessary. But for me <clears throat> to consider another option, like a different mindset, um, a lot of things had to fall away, had to crumble, mm-hmm. and that's what happened. I experienced a lot of loss in a short amount of time, and. I started grieving and my husband (laughs) kept saying, why don't you get some of these emotions out? Like, that's a lot to hold on to. Start journaling, start writing things down. And I did. And the more I journaled, the better I started feeling. Mm -hmm. And I was like, weird. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have listened to him sooner. (laughs) And then I started reading because I had a little more room mentally. Right, right. And I started wanting to learn and read. And so I picked up this book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. Mm -hmm. Classic. It's so, (laughs) it's so good. It's so good. Um, It's something that's used a lot in the school systems around the country. Um, Really fun. I was introduced to it back in my teaching days. Yeah. (gasps) That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, but what, what, what my administrator didn't know is I was also working on a side hustle, so I could apply it both places. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> Serendipitous, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I picked up that book. I started reading and I just remember thinking there was this light bulb moment where I realized, oh my word, could my, could the thoughts I'm thinking be causing me a lot of this stress. Mm. And while I don't want to invalidate my experience or the experience of anyone who has mental health struggles, different privilege than I do, um, a different lived experience than I do, um, our thoughts do cause a lot of stress and Mm -hmm. suffering. Um, They don't cause all of it, (laughs) but they do cause, they do cause some stress and suffering. Mm -hmm. And so I it was a little too much to just jump in and believe that my mindset could change if I changed my thoughts Mm -hmm. and I could get different results. If I changed my thoughts, that was a little too much. So one of the things I started doing, and I still do it to this day is I added what if to everything. So I started asking myself, what if my thoughts create my results? What if that's true? And at first it was a little hard because I had a lot of results I didn't like at that point. I had people that were unhappy. I had people that were stressed out and they were reaching out to me. And I felt like that was all mine to take on. I needed to also feel stressed. I needed to also feel unhappy because they were unhappy. And I didn't really have resources to separate myself from the experience of my clients while still resolving a problem. Okay, I just need to interrupt you because it's like the life of a bridal seamstress. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that listeners are like, oh my goodness, that's literally me, whether they're brand new and starting off their business or they've been doing it, you know, for years. Like, um, you know, where you're not the only one who's gonna make a mistake in your business or mm-hmm. disappoint a client or like have a miscommunication. And so these feelings can be so overwhelming. And, um, Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just got, so excited. like, this is exactly where I know so many people are sitting in their sewing business and feeling like there's like this, it's, this is the way that it is to work with brides. Like you have to live with these feelings and that guilt or like that constant pressured stress. So keep going. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a lot to deal with on a regular basis. And I get it a hundred percent. So I like to view the change that I went through in two ways. So if you're someone listening to this, who has experienced um, these feelings of like the intense pressure mm-hmm. to perform, to make others happy, to <clears throat> follow other people's advice who may you perceive them to be more successful than you. And the pieces are not fitting you. Mm -hmm. It's not working for you and you don't know what to do about it. Um, I like to view the change I went through in two parts. So number one is the foundation and number two is the connection to others. A lot of people who have um, current issues with clients and expectations, customers, um, and communicating to them you probably want to start with that connection piece while you're working on the foundation behind the scenes. So from a connection piece, I started mentally picturing that like people were trying to hand me baggage and I started mentally picturing mental picturing works for me. Um, if you aren't a very visual person, um, maybe there's an auditory or a more kinesthetic approach that you might really relate to. But I started just viewing people as handing me baggage. And the more I took on, the more I couldn't do anything else, but hold the baggage. So I started, as I started listening to a customer that needed some help or was stressed out with a change that was happening in their schedule. um, And we needed to add an hour or something like that. I started envisioning, they were trying to hand me something and all I was doing was saying like, mentally saying like, I don't have to take it. It's okay if she like holds it out to me and then realizes I don't want to take it on or that she 
reaches out to me and, and drops it on the ground. Like, it's okay to let it drop. And I started doing that more and that did help. So good foundation, like a good exercise to start with, just like visualizing that like, it's okay to not just automatically reach out and take Ooh, the thing. That's so hard though. <laughs> it is, but <laughs> you can soften it. Add that what if, like what would happen if I didn't take the thing she's reaching out about? Mm -hmm. What would happen if she had to hold on to her pain and stress mm. and I didn't take it from her and try to make it better? Mm -hmm. And then just play with the idea. Maybe that is a little overwhelming and that's okay. But adding that what if does soften things and give you a little more of an open mind to consider options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So while you're building that connection or while I was building that connection and doing that mental visualization, the other thing I was doing was working on myself behind the scenes because you can have all the boundaries in the world, but you mentioned like I would enforce my boundaries and then feel like a schmuck. Yeah. I felt that way too. And I started asking myself, like, why is that? Why do I feel that way? And again, I cannot speak for anyone else, but I know what it was for me. And it was that I was alone with me at the end of it. And I didn't like me. So being, enforcing a boundary, risking someone else not liking or validating me and then having to do that work on myself mm -hmm. liking me and validating me that was lonely work hard yeah. work and work that wasn't I didn't know how to do at first mm -hmm. so it's hard to have boundaries when when you know that you're going to be with yourself at the end of it and maybe with no one else yeah. That no one else will be connecting with you because you put up a boundary. Right. Yeah. And I think also like when, you know, we all have some friends that we can kind of bounce things off of. And I have, you know, some really trusted seamstress friends that I can go to and like run scenarios by. And I like mm -hmm. it because they give me a couple different scenarios. Like I had a, a really difficult experience in May. And I had a couple girlfriends that I ran the situation by. And one of my friends, Andra, if you're listening, this is you. She was like, you know, you got to do what gives you peace. And if that means that you give this partial refund that you know <laughs> that maybe she doesn't deserve, but it's going to give you peace and you're going to feel like you did the right thing and it just kind of gets her out of your life. Okay. Like, and it was almost like I kind of got that permission slip to do what I was comfortable, like going to bed at night knowing that I did. And so like, you can get all this advice from different people or like, Oh, you should, you know, set your boundary or you should say this or, or respond this way or add this to your contract, but you are alone with yourself and your business at the end of the day. So it needs to align with like your personal, like your character and, and yes. what you want your business to stand for. And it may not be the same thing that like your neighbor's business stands for, or, you know, like you mentioned earlier, somebody that you think has this, like, you know, thriving business that you hope to be just like, it's like, you have to do you because you're alone with yourself at the end of the day. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Nadine. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like you should have a podcast and share this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My goal is to just like, uh, if you have those weird loser feels, it's like, you're not alone, but there's like this misconception that everything has to be done the same way. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, that's the beauty of having a small business. Like it's based on you and you're going to attract the, the people. If you do it the right way, you know, you're going to attract the people that you truly do want to work with. Yes. Anyway, I went a little, that's my little soapbox, but it's so good. So good. Yeah. <laughs> so worth taking time to discuss. <laughs> and I feel like, um, what people don't know how to connect with is how do I, I start like being okay with being with me, mm -hmm. um, especially for people who have maybe attachment wounding from their early childhood, um, trauma in their backgrounds, anything like that, being alone with yourself, um, can bring up a lot of wounds. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do to change that? That's going to be a little bit longer of a process. But one of the things I like to remember 
is that somebody wrote about this. I think it was Peter Levine, maybe, who's a researcher in trauma. And mindset is closely related. Mm -hmm. Um, So he talked about the embodied self and this idea that like us being who we truly are, like the best version of ourselves and like us being our full character, which like our stress responses are not our character. That's Mm. not who we are. That's our stress response. Can you say that again? Your stress response isn't who you are. That's not your character. That's so good. Mm -hmm. That's your panic response. That's your fight or flight. Mm -hmm. That's it. So who are you then underneath (laughs) all of that? And how do you find out? Right. Especially if you're in like a a high stress job, you need to know who you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he, whoever, whoever talks about this, he talks about the eight C's of the embodied self. And he says like, I've worked with thousands of people and I keep coming back to these characteristics and they're all really similar that when people are able to get out of panic, get out of their high stress responses, um, they all have really similar characteristics. And one of them is curiosity. When people can be curious um, and compassionate Mm. and the list goes on. But it's all these really lovely characteristics. If you look up the eight C's of the embodied self, um, you'll probably find that. But I always go to the first two I see in my work with clients is curiosity and then compassion. I'm Mm -hmm. curious about what might change if I tried. And then how do you feel for yourself that you did the best you can? I feel sad that I didn't know any differently. Yeah. So that's a form of compassion. So we start seeing that like the more you uncover that you're acting in stress and you're taking on things that aren't yours, you have to actually excavate. You have to, you have to take off all the layers that you put on all the baggage that you're holding. And underneath of that, you find who you are. And most people, as we start doing this work together, they start saying, I am a really cool person. (laughs) I had no idea. And it like, it gave me goosebumps because it's just, then it becomes so much easier to have boundaries, to communicate them, to even attract in people who are naturally respectful people, because Mm -hmm. the more you respect yourself, the more people will mirror and reflect that back to you. You'll attract in respectful clients, right? The more that you can respect yourself. Right. And not abandon yourself when somebody's unhappy. Right. Right. There's kind of this like rhetoric in the sewing community that, you know, and, and not, I, I wouldn't say like a majority of seamstresses still think that way, but like, you know, brides are the bad guys. And it's like, we mm. just have to suck it up and serve them because who else is going to fix their dress and they're going to come with all their issues. And, and it's like thinking of, what if we came to our clients or meeting our clients from just a completely different perspective, like you said, with these like eight C's um, Mm -hmm. and you're anticipating this positive experience too. Right. And then um, another wise girlfriend once told me like when, when we have clients that are at their max and they're like, you know, letting it all out on us, it's never about us. It is about something that they're bringing in. So when you think about that, it's like, Oh, my heart hurts for you because you want to be so excited for your big day and you can't help it that you're so obsessed with your underarms or like you have this obsession that you've lived with your whole life, like hating this part of your body and it has nothing to do with me or my work. And I, I feel bad that you can't get past this for your wedding day or whatever, but like, it just gives you the freedom to like, love them instead of like, Oh, they're the bad guy. And I'm here to, you know, fix their dress and, and put up with their drama. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And the reality is like, if you think about it, when we're in times of high stress and conflict, which I mean, a lot of times wedding businesses can feel like hostage negotiations. Like you have to have <laughs> skills. <laughs> I mean, do you disagree? No, no. <laughs> I feel it feels kind of uncomfortable saying that, but like it does feel like that sometimes. Like you have to yeah. talk to people down. Mm-hmm. You really have to have skills with communicating with people right. in high stress 
situation. Yeah. But what typically happens is when we're in those high stress situations, um, the, the highest energy rules the conversation. So mm. you oh. start reflecting and matching that energy. Wow. That's amazing. I'm just, it's a, a scenario comes to mind from literally last week. And I had a bride who recently had, um, a weight loss surgery. So, well, not recently, it was a few years ago. So she had a lot of extra skin mm -hmm. and I'm looking at her and I'm like, you look incredible. Like, I mean, she just looks beautiful, you know, and she had this like glowing tan and she looked awesome. And then she came for her pickup appointment and like, she was nitpicking everything, not about the dress, but about herself. And then it was like, can you just, can you tr and maybe put a stitch here? I mean, it was like the most minuscule request. And I'm like, don't roll your eyes. Don't roll your eyes. And then I was like, wait a minute she doesn't see herself the way that I see her. So how can I help her? And then it was like, my response is instead of becoming like defensive of like, it's fine or it looks good or no, your boobs look fine. It was like, I could meet her, um, like self-deprecating comment with a, Oh, from an objective view, this is how I see you. I'm not, um, making less of your feelings, but, you know, this is a different perspective. And instead of coming at coming across like defensive of my work, I was just kind of like meeting her where she was at. But so when you said matching that energy, she ended up leaving with the dress happy. I saw her sister two days later because her sister is a bridesmaid. And she was like, Oh my goodness. She had such a great fitting with you. She's so happy with her dress. So I know it wasn't like, I just shooed her out of my door and like, it looks fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it, like, just go. It was like, she was truly happy with herself, with the results. And, um, but I remember that specific moment in the fitting where I had to be like, okay, don't sound like a defensive jerk. Like this is, you know, she's in a different place and how can I meet her where she's at? Mm, that was so cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Nadine. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And, but it would have been really easy to just kind of stick to like, I know that I sewed that right. And it looks as good as it's going to look, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's so easy to do because we always think that people's unhappiness is about us. Yes. Yes. And it's not their unhappiness is their projection of themselves mm -hmm. onto other people. Mm -hmm. They're just bringing their own baggage with them and looking for the first person that will hold on to it for them and give them some relief. Wow. That's so good. Yes. I gotta like, I can't wait to listen to this again for myself. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Wow. It's, when you take on that mentality too, like, wow, this has nothing to do with me. This is about her and her perception of herself or not that I need to understand what, why somebody is acting the way they are. But most of the time, if I can think, she probably came in here with this. Mm -hmm. She probably came in here with this um, unhappiness or this stress that does help me connect to compassion and um, maybe even find a way to connect with the client themselves without taking on their baggage. Because we often think that like, well, that's how I connect. Like I reach out and I take that and that's the point of connection. Mm -hmm. No. No, it's seeing people for who they truly are. Like you said, like you said, you did people want most of all in the connection. They want to be seen for who they are and not who they hope to be or who they failed at being. Mm -hmm. They want somebody to know this is who I am. Take it or leave it. And they're hoping you'll say, take it easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they do that in small, small situations. Like working with their bridal seamstress and in their big lifelong or larger scale relationships that are a defining element of their lives. Mm -hmm. So knowing that we have a lot of people coming into our worlds that are deeply insecure mm -hmm. in fragile emotional states. And then we can match that and say like, oh yeah, <laughs> if you're stressed out, watch this. I'm going to get more stressed out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take on everything you brought and I'm going to make sure you still feel it too. And we don't know we're doing this. This all right. happens without our, without our conscious awareness. It's just how we deal with stress. And mm -hmm. 
understanding and becoming aware of how we deal with stress, what we do when we become in a panic response. So fight, freeze, flight, those kinds of responses. Um, that's going to take knowing that once you know how you deal with stress, you can also change that. Mm -hmm. And that's where going back to a growth mindset, it's the idea that you can continue to improve and change and adapt and grow over life. Whereas a fixed mindset believes that like I'm born with a set of skills and I have to maintain those skills and be and label myself for my entire life. I'm the creative one. I'm the, I'm bad at math. Mm -hmm. Like getting a C does not make you bad at math. I feel Um, like you're like saying my life right now. (laughs) We're twins. (laughs) (laughs) Or I'm unorganized or I don't know how to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like, or so many, yeah, there's just so many of those. This is just so good. And I'm thinking about listeners who are like, oh my gosh, how do I even like get started? Like what are like this week, what are three tangible things that they can do to get this ball rolling with, to improve their own mindset? Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would do is start incorporating the what if statements. So once you start noticing your thoughts, like mm-hmm. I am thinking the thought, um, I, she's so stressed out. She's unhappy with me. And I'm thinking specifically of a, of a bridal seamstress client. So a bridesmaid or a bride coming in, she's so unhappy with me. First label that that's a thought. Okay. So I'm thinking a thought that says she's unhappy with me. Um, what happens next? So start exploring, like, and do this on your own time, not in the moment, <laughs> not when you have the thought and she's right in front of you. I've done this. I've done this at um, weddings <laughs> because like, I don't know, your journey is what it is, but I did do that at a wedding. I was um, be- mentally beating myself up for taking a photo wrong, a series of photos wrong for like 10 solid minutes. And oh, no. I oh, no. muttered out loud, Stephanie, you stupid idiot. I can't even believe, like, I don't even say that those words anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's what I said. And one of the catering staff was right next to me. And she just kind of looked at me like, were you talking to me? And I was in my own world. And I had just started learning how to identify my thoughts and try on different thoughts, mm-hmm. much like a garment. Mm-hmm. And right out loud, after I muttered that first part, I then said, I am not a stupid idiot. I'm tired and I messed up and I'm fixing it. Mm-hmm. And I said that like out loud, no muttering, just out loud, proclaimed it. And the girl was like <laughs> pouring water next to me, like staring at me, like, what is going on? So if that's what happens, it happens and you're not alone. I've been there. But if you can, like maybe at the end of the day, just notice your thoughts, go back to a stressful situation, notice your thoughts, write them down, and then ask yourself, what happens next? What happened in me next? Okay. So maybe you notice what happens in your body. Maybe your pulse starts racing. Mm -hmm. Maybe you start, um, get that feeling in the pit of my stomach. Like it just go like, oh my God, no. Yeah. Yes. This, that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. Yep. So notice that, write that down too. And then what happens next? Usually when we feel physical pain, we want to get rid of it right away. And so then what do you do? What are your resources that you go to? Whether or not you feel like they're great resources, what are they? Mm -hmm. Um, And so most people might go to like, I try to make it better or I try to over explain myself or I, um, I beat myself up and I like to use self-deprecating humor or I blame shift. And you'll look at all the resources that you do go to and just know that like they have worked because they've gotten you this far. Okay. So there's Mm -hmm. no need to feel shame for seeing that "Mm, I am 
I'm not who I want to be in those moments. Of course not. Mm -hmm. You're building new skills right now. Mm -hmm. And everyone deals with stress and it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So notice those things and then start gathering evidence of alternative ways to see these situations and going to that what if statement. What if um, what if that wasn't true? What if she wasn't unhappy with me? What changes then? And then pause, notice what's happening in your body. Um, I actually don't get that feeling in the pit of my stomach. I actually feel something kind of heavy in my chest and it feels like sadness. Mm. I feel sad for her. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? And follow that through until you have an action and a result. Mm -hmm. And I think what you'll notice is that as you try that out, you start seeing, okay, these are my go-to resources. And if I change my thoughts in the moment, I actually get different results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that seeing. can follow you. Yeah. As you're just going through that, I was thinking, wow, yeah, then when that happens, then all of a sudden she and I are on the same team. It's not mm -hmm. like we're pitting it, you know, I'm pit yeah. pitting myself against her or whatever. Yeah. That is so great. So that's in the moment. And then what's something they can do? Um, give us some journal. This is very vague. Give us some journaling <laughs> prompts, but um, yeah. What are, when I love journaling, so I, it's not a struggle for me. I'm like, give me, I have a journal like in every room in my house. Oh but, my gosh, um, me too. <laughs> Like, no, hmm, I want you to write something down real quick. Okay. Let me just, you know, so, yes. but for people, I can see how, if you don't journal, it's like, okay, hey, what, what do I dear diary? Like, how do I get started? So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually reaching for this right now. I made some journals and they were ooh. kind of based on different phases that I had gone through. So mm -hmm. the one I would recommend starting with is I'll tell you the technique so you can do it on your own. If you have journals, everywhere in your house, you like Nadine, or you have something you can start with. It does not matter. Just mm -hmm. start where you can. If you want you can start with an ugly notebook, if you need exactly, to, exactly. House, yes, yes, yes. although I do write more when it's a cute journal. So yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, and sometimes it's, mm -hmm. they all just started falling down. <laughs> I have a million journals. Um, here's the stack for reference. <gasps> Ooh, beautiful. I love those. So colors. these are all mine that I've made mm -hmm. Ooh, and yay. proofs that I'm getting in. So I would start when people are starting out, they need a place to not just put their thoughts, but prioritize them. Ooh. So I would start with this one. This, this one is called the bright ideas thought download organizer. So what I would do is first start by just dumping out any thoughts in your mind onto paper. Even if you're not sure how to get started, then write that, that's a thought, write that down. I'm not sure what to write today. And try different structures, maybe setting a timer for one to two minutes works for you. Maybe just filling one page works for you. Maybe just opening and writing something is a good start for you. What I started doing, and you can see the pages on this for Ooh, anyone yeah. watching. What I started doing is I'll write down everything on one page and just dump it mm -hmm. out. And then when I feel like I'm done, I start asking, okay, what else? And then I pause and wait and things start popping up into my mind and I'll keep writing and I'll do that a few times. Mm -hmm. Then I use, you can look this up. So for anyone who's like, I'm not buying a journal right now. Um, look up the Eisenhower matrix and you'll see it's like a quadrant system. So then what you're going to do is you're going to organize any of the thoughts that you dumped out onto this paper. You're going to organize them like, what do I need to do? What of these things are things I need to take action on? What of these items are things I need to make decisions about? What do I need to delegate to somebody else? Like this isn't my responsibility or I'm taking responsibility and I can't fulfill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Small business life. <laughs> and then yeah, what do I need to delete? Mm -hmm. Ooh, Get rid okay. of it. It's really not important. It's stressing me out, but um, I'm investing energy into something that ultimately doesn't change. 
Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do. That's a process that I would, I would go through and start with. I like structures a little more than prompts. So that's my personal approach, but Mm -hmm. I would start there because it's really hard to change your mind when you don't know what's in it. Like, what are you changing? Mm -hmm. So let's get to know what's there first. Mm -hmm. And I think actually like writing down the thoughts that you hear is really eye-opening too, because then you, you literally are looking at like, oh my gosh, that's what's going on in my head. Like, you know, uh, we're just so used to it or the voice in our head that we don't think about what it's actually saying because it's been going on for 20 years or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. becoming aware of your thoughts is, um, take some skill. Mm Mm-hmm. And it takes just stopping in the moment and then just writing down, like, I had the thought about myself, Stephanie, you, Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah. (laughs) even that I was like, I don't even want to say anything like that out loud. Um, But it happens. Mm -hmm. And the more we write these things down, capture it, and then notice it, we can actually create separation from ourselves in that thought. And we can be like, yes, "Um, never say that to someone I love. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have some love to learn to give to myself. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. I'm really excited for people listening. Um, especially if they have never even considered maybe what mindset work is, or they think that it's this kind of like wooey, like, oh, it doesn't apply to me. Cause I have a real business. It's like, mm. so I hope that it really speaks to a lot of listeners, but how could we get in touch with you, work with you, get to know you more, give us all that good stuff. And I will type this out in the show notes too, but I'd like to hear it awesome. from you. I would say the two simplest ways to connect with me and maybe get to know me and my content a little bit more are on Instagram and TikTok. Um, so those resources, um, my Instagram handle is at the Stephanie booth and there you would have liberty to direct message me. So Mm -hmm. if you're on Instagram and you're reading my posts or watching reels or stories or whatever, um, you can comment, you can talk to me. I voice note, um, text note, whatever works for you is totally fine with me on TikTok. You can't really do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can get a sense for the kind of content that I'm producing there. And that is my handle. There is cycle breaker one Oh one. And my focus is a little bit different than on Instagram where I'm focusing more on, um, helping people heal from trauma, chronic stress and burnout. So those are two great resources. My website is breakthroughmethod.co. And if you want that bright ideas, thought download organizer, you can go on Amazon and Yay. you can just oh, type in. Yeah. Yay. That's so you can new. buy any yeah. of my journals on Amazon. Um, look up my author name, Stephanie J. Booth. Mm-hmm. And my recommendation would be to start with the bright ideas. Um, that thought is so download. exciting. Wow. Thank you. And congratulations, because I don't think I've congratulated you since the journals dropped. So that's super <laughs> exciting. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Yes. Thank and you're the journal queen. So it's like, yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> it does. <laughs> well, Stephanie, thank you. This is just so, um, it's a, it's a different topic for the podcast, but I think it's so necessary. And I think especially knowing how much it has served me and my own business and just beyond the business, like my holistic life, you know, and my marriage and all these other goals that I've had. So, um, I appreciate your time so much and for sharing your story and simplifying, you know, mindset work, which can seem a little like, what is that? So thanks for the clarifying. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. (laughs)